Starting a healthy eating routine can seem completely overwhelming at first, but there are a few things that can make it a million times easier. So if you've been trying for a while and you keep coming up against roadblocks, it may be time to implement a different system. Now, if we've never met before, I'm Maddie. I've been vegan for six years and I am passionate about meal prep. And I hope after today's video, you'll see why. So let's get into some of these solutions that will actually help you eat healthy this year because only about 12% of adults in the US consume the recommended daily intake of fruits and vegetables. Now, I know that eating healthy is often easier said than done. And that's why I try and make it as convenient as possible. And for me, the best way that I've found to do that is through meal prep. Take this as an example. Which of these would you rather eat? Oh, not this one? Let me tell you, I spent a lot of time last year working on my meal prep game. Now, this is actually something I started a long, long time ago, but admittedly, I fell off the consistency wagon for a few years. During my weight loss journey, which you can actually watch here, I just found myself needing that simplicity and that ability to have healthy meals on demand. This was actually a huge part of why I think my weight loss was successful. And when I started sharing about it on here, on this channel, a lot of people told me that they they wanted to try it out as well. So what exactly is meal prep? Meal prep is simply the concept of preparing whole meals or dishes ahead of schedule. Now this could be full meals, it could be side dishes, or in my world, it could even be a veggie prep, which is like washing and chopping your vegetables. I have kind of taken the term meal prep and transformed it to mean any kind of food prep you do in advance to make your life easier. And that's because a lot of people do turn their nose up when they first hear the words meal prep because they think it means the exact same meal eaten seven days in a row with absolutely no variety. And while some people really do love that kind of simplicity and there's nothing wrong with that, that definitely doesn't have to be what meal prep is. So instead, I like to think of meal prep in three different categories. First is the traditional meal prep that most people think of. That would be planning out meals for the whole week and preparing them in advance. Now, even though people usually think that looks like this, you definitely don't have to eat the same thing for five days in a row, even if you're doing a traditional style meal prep. I think it's actually important to note here that even a traditional meal prep can be flexible and it just takes a little bit of creativity for the day that you're doing the prep work. But even if you don't have time to do a full on meal prep, or maybe that style just doesn't work for you, you can do instead what I like to call a batch prep. Make a big batch of healthy grains, some beans, tofu, maybe some roasted veggies or some steamed veggies. And this way you'll still have some combining to do throughout the week, but you won't have nearly as much cooking. So this option is going to provide a lot of flexibility for those who wanna save time, but also wanna switch up their meals throughout the week. Now, even when using this method, I still suggest you write out some kind of a general plan of meal ideas and that's for two reasons number one when you make your shopping list you want to have a good idea of what you need so that you buy the right things and that you don't overspend especially now with prices rising. And second of all, when it comes time to actually make the meals, you don't wanna be staring at a fridge full of side dishes thinking, what the heck am I gonna make with these? Now, if I don't have time to cook even just a few things at the beginning of the week, the most important Sunday staple for me is to wash and chop my vegetables. Actually, this one practice alone probably doubled my vegetable consumption last year because it is just so easy to incorporate. So this is what I recommend to most beginners because if you're trying to eat healthier or just incorporate more vegetables into your diet, it is just such a simple technique. It is fast, it is easy, and it makes sure that you use up the vegetables that you buy at the grocery store instead of letting them sit and wilt at the back of the fridge and then throwing them out a week later. We've all been there, right? Now, of course, if you choose the wash and shop technique, you will still have to cook and put things together to get your meals ready. But I always just find that the most laborious and disliked part of a meal prep is to do the washing and chopping of the vegetables. So this just gets it out of the way for the rest of the week. Now, the one exception to this rule is when I have vegetables that can sit in the fridge for a long time untouched. So for example, I often buy large bags of carrots, beets, bell peppers, and celery. And these are all vegetables that can sit in the fridge untouched for a minimum of one week sometimes longer depending on the vegetable. So what I like to do with those is just wash and chop what I need. Usually is about half the quantity of the bag and the others I will leave untouched in the fridge for the following week's prep. I've even done this with things like romaine lettuce, which typically people think goes bad really quickly, but I just pull off the outer leaves, wash and chop those and store those inner leaves untouched whole in the fridge until the following week. Now produce storage itself is actually a huge part of meal prep and shouldn't be overlooked. 
So if you're someone who buys produce with the best intentions of eating healthy all week, only to find yourself throwing away that same produce, moldy and wilted a week later, then it might be time to change up your storage techniques. So let's go ahead and start with fruit and more specifically berries. I do happen to have some blueberries fresh from the store, so let me show you guys how I wash and store them. Now, most of the advice that I've read for berries is to wash them just before you use them. But I personally find that if I do that, I end up not using them at all. Sure, in an ideal world, I would be rinsing everything right before I use it, but I don't know about you guys, but I make breakfast in about three minutes or less, and I don't wanna be taking up time every single day rinsing berries. So let me show you instead what has been working for me. I actually just do a little solution of water and plain vinegar. You can do about two tablespoons for three cups of water, but it's fine to just eyeball this. Now, supposedly the vinegar is what kills off any mold here. Now, I don't know if this is scientifically true, but like I said, it has always worked for me. So just let that soak for about five minutes and then go ahead and rinse your berries with plain cold water. And then you wanna make sure that they're really dry. So go ahead and spread them out on either a tea towel or some paper towel. Pro tip, keep an eye out for any bad berries while you're doing this because one bad berry can spoil all the others around it. Now, when you're ready to store your berries, go ahead and line your Tupperware with either a tea towel or some paper towel. This will help absorb some of the moisture which causes mold, so definitely don't skip this part. This hack will work for strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries, but I do find it's best to store different berries separately because they spoil at different rates, so it's better just to keep them separate. Also, if you aren't going to use your berries right away, let's say you have a special recipe that that you've purchased them for and you know you won't be using them for a few days, then it is best to wait to rinse them if that's an option, especially with delicate berries such as raspberries. They really are best if you rinse them and then use them right away. So of course the storage technique that I just shared is the best for having your berries ready to use. Now, I have recently seen a TikTok hack for keeping your lemons in the fridge in a jar of water. And I was like, what? I've always kept my lemons in the fridge. I find that they already last for a really long time, probably at least about a month. So I personally haven't tried the lemons in water hack. If any of you have tried it, let me know in a comment down below. But I'm gonna share with you my trick for storing lemons in the fridge. Actually, my favorite way to store lemons is to wash them all at once and then juice them all and zest them all as well. And then you just keep all the juice and zest separately, of course, in the freezer. But since we're talking about fresh hacks today, not freezer hacks, then I will show you what I usually do if I wanna keep them fresh. So I find that just placing them in the bottom crisper drawer of the fridge, unwashed, just straight from the grocery store, will keep them fresh and ready to go for at least a month. Or if you want your lemons really ready to use, go ahead and juice them and store that lemon juice in the fridge in a glass jar. The juice will stay fresh for a couple weeks and this way it'll be much easier to add into your recipes. So all we need to do for asparagus is to trim the ends and add them to a glass filled with about an inch of water. And once your asparagus is looking like a bouquet of flowers, go ahead and store that in the fridge and just change the water every few days or as needed. Beets are great because they are quite hardy and they actually last in the fridge quite a while. If you end up buying beets with the leaves attached, you do wanna remove the leaves before storing your beets in the fridge. So go ahead and just chop those and actually beet greens can be eaten, so don't throw those away. So once you've removed the leaves from your beets, go ahead and store them in either a plastic bag or a produce bag in your crisper drawer. And that is why I love beets because they're one of the few vegetables that I don't have to stress about meal prepping right away. I mean, I do usually end up washing them at the same time as everything else, but at least I know I have the option to keep them in the crisper drawer if I can't get to them right away. Carrots should also be kept loose in the crisper drawer of your fridge, and similar to the beets, if you do buy them with the greens on, you do wanna cut them off before storing them. Carrot greens can also be eaten, so do not throw those away either. I will actually leave a recipe in the description box down below for carrot top pesto if any of you wanna check that out. Another tip that I just recently learned, which I actually always used to do, is not to store your carrots near apples because this can actually cause bitterness in your carrots. Now, similar to the lettuce and celery hack that I showed you guys in the batch prep video, old carrots can be revived by soaking them in a bath of cold water. And just like the celery, if you want to, you can store your cut up carrots in Tupperwares of water and that will help keep them extra crisp. 
Now for fresh herbs, I usually see the most popular method of storing them is to do the same as you would with the asparagus, which is basically just to store them like a bouquet of flowers in a small jar of water. And I found that this kind of works sometimes, but here's my issues with this method. A, I usually see it done with a plastic bag covering the herbs even when they're stored in the fridge, and I don't usually have extra plastic bags lying around the house. B, it does take up a lot of space in the fridge and you need a shelf tall enough to be able to fit the herbs herbs, and C, they're not ready to use because they're not washed. Also, with basil, I think you're supposed to keep it in water but outside the fridge, and that also never works for me. I don't know, but my basil does not like to live in water, so here's what I have found works instead. As soon as I get them home or whenever I'm doing my meal prep, I go ahead and wash them in a separate basin just to keep them separated. And then we're gonna store them in the same way that you would lettuce and other leafy greens, which if you haven't seen that video yet, I will link it up here as well as in the description box down below. And I just find that my cilantro, my mint, even green onions really stay fresh this way. And they are super easy to use because they are washed, ready to go. You can just take them out of the fridge and chop them up. Or like with the green onions, I like to use the kitchen scissors. And I find that they stay fresh this way for a couple weeks and I'm much more likely to use them as well. Also, as I showed you guys with regrowing lettuce, you can do the same with your green onions, just save this bottom piece right here, add it to a jar with some water, and the greens will regrow. Learning to store my produce in the right ways and actually just meal prep in general has saved me so much money in the last couple years. It's definitely no secret that food prices are on the rise lately, but what does seem to be secret is how to actually save money on groceries. And I'm not just talking about clipping coupons, but real tangible tips that you can start implementing right away. So I'm gonna share with you some of my top tips for saving money on groceries. If you've heard this tip before, there is a reason for that. It is because it's true. Buying produce that is in season and or local means that you're not necessarily paying for the high price that it costs to get the food to you. So as you'll probably notice with fall coming, you'll start to see a lot more pumpkins, squash, apples, etc. And that is because they are just more readily available as these crops start coming into the stores. Now, of course, you'll probably always be able to find a pint of raspberries or blueberries somewhere, but guess what? When they are out of season, they are going to be much more expensive than they are in summer. I recently subscribed to something called Odd Bunch, which is specific to the greater Toronto area. And what they do is they take produce that would otherwise be thrown out because maybe it's not visually perfect enough to sell at the supermarkets and they sell it at a discounted price. And there are plenty like this in the US as well. There is Misfits Market, Imperfect Foods, Hungry Harvest. I'll actually link some of those down below in the description box in case you wanna check them out. So these are a great option to get produce at a discounted price if they offer this service in your area. Or another alternative to this might be a CSA or Farm Box. CSA stands for Community Support agriculture and it's usually a monthly subscription box where you can get produce from your local farmers at a lower price than it would be at the grocery stores. Now of course this isn't always going to be the cheaper option across the board. You might need to do some price comparisons of your CSA or Imperfects box compared to your local produce but I know like in our case I have done the calculations for the Odd Bunch box versus my regular no frills store and it is so much cheaper to buy the Odd Bunch produce. Now, maybe not every grocery store has this, but if yours does, this can be a hidden little gem. In the produce area, there's often a little section or shelf of items that are still perfectly good, but maybe they're a little wilted or not as fresh as they used to be, but they are on major, major discount. So next time you're in the produce section, keep an eye out for this shelf. Usually, when you buy a large amount of something, the price for individual units tends to be lower. For example, I bought this 10 kg bag of black beans for $20 at Costco, which is 20 cents per 100 grams. And even comparing it to some of the cheapest options at my local no frills, it is still about half the price in terms of price per gram. Now, while it may seem like buying in bulk is a great deal, and it definitely can be, it isn't always cheaper, and let me explain why. If you don't actually use the items that you buy in bulk and you end up letting them expire and having to throw them away, then of course you're not going to be saving money. And another thing that I've actually found myself guilty of is not to use more of something just because it's there. Now, this isn't really a problem with things like beans and grains that I buy in bulk, but if it's something more delicious like chips or pretzels or chocolate chips, then I do have to be a little more careful not to use it all up right away. Buying more should not equal using more, if that makes sense. 
I think there's a common misconception that buying frozen produce isn't as healthy as fresh, and that's really not true. In fact, some people say that frozen is actually healthier because that produce is picked at its peak and it's flash frozen, which means it's going to retain its vitamins and minerals versus fresh is going to lose some of those nutrients over time. Not to mention how much less expensive it's going to be. Let's just take a look at raspberries, for example. Currently at my no frills, they are coming in at around $3 per 100 grams versus these frozen that I just bought were a dollar and 15 cents per 100 grams. Granted, they were on sale, which is why I stocked up and bought two of them, but even their non-sale price puts them at $1.50 per 100 grams. So in summer, I do tend to buy a lot of fresh produce. It's in season, you can usually find some great deals and you just can't beat the texture. But if you are on a tight budget, do not forget about frozen. It can definitely be the cheaper option. I swear granola has to be one of the most expensive items at the grocery store. I see it for like four, five, six, seven dollars sometimes, and I used to buy those. My husband loves granola, and I used to think, ugh, it's such a pain to make it at home. I'm just gonna buy the store-bought version. But let me tell you, after doing a quick price comparison, I was like, whoa, we are making this at home from now on. Not to mention, you can control the ingredients, so it's usually a little bit healthier that way as well. So I like to do homemade granola, jam, trail mix, and of course, I do all my beans from scratch, I don't buy canned anymore. And just recently, I tried homemade fruit leather for the first time, and it was actually so easy and delicious. I'll link that video down below in case you wanna check it out. Now, I personally do not have any backyard space and therefore no garden, but I have still managed to grow some small items at home. Herb plants are pretty inexpensive, and as long as you tend to them, they will continue to grow. You can also regrow lettuce and green onion by keeping the roots in water, and sprouts. These are by far my most favorite thing to grow at home because they are so easy and they turn out so well. Alfalfa sprouts are usually, what, $2.50 or $3 a box at the grocery store, maybe a little more if they're organic, versus this whole bag was only five dollars and it's got to be the equivalent of about 10 or 15 boxes of sprouts it is such a good deal and even if you don't have access to specific sprouts like these you can use regular legumes for sprouting such as green mung beans it's a very similar process just soak drain and rinse and you'll be able to grow them into edible sprouts my husband has forced me to do a monthly budget for about five years now. We started when we were world traveling for a year because we were on a tight budget and really couldn't run out of money. And I say forced me, but of course I am joking. He actually really inspired me to learn to budget and this practice turned out to be so beneficial to our money saving goals that we continued on even after the trip was over and we still do it to this day. Now there are a couple different ways you could do this. We usually just make a monthly grocery budget and make sure we stay under that. You could also include eating out in this monthly budget or you could keep it in a separate cost if you are specifically trying to cut back on how much you spend at restaurants, you could definitely keep that category separate and compare how much you spend on groceries versus eating out. And that way you'll be able to see if you really do need to cut back or not. And if you're more like me and spend a lot at the grocery store, but you don't really know how or on what, you might wanna spend a month tracking individual purchases. This can be really eye-opening to see where in your grocery budget you're spending the most, whether it be on snack foods or convenience foods or something else. Usually for me, it's something like fancy vegan cheeses. So so this has really helped me to see where I'm spending that extra money and be able to cut back on those purchases if needed. Little known fact, looking at prices of two items side by side doesn't always help you see which one is cheaper. You actually wanna compare price per gram or price per ounce or whatever unit of measurement the item is in. Now, a lot of grocery stores do this for you already. If you take a look under the price, you'll see this very tiny value, which is price per 100 grams. Now, if your store doesn't do this, or even if it's just too tiny to read, you can actually calculate this yourself. Take the price first, then divide by the grams or ounces or whatever unit of measurement it's in. This is now the price per gram. So if we compare this one versus this one, you can see the price per gram is lower here. So this is the one we want. So you can do this for grams, pounds, ounces, kgs, etc. Always just put in the price first and then the unit of measurement. Do make sure though that when you're comparing two items, they are both in the same unit. So both in grams or both in ounces, you get the idea. This one is pretty self-explanatory and I wouldn't be surprised if you've heard it before, but it is true. Hungry shoppers spend more money. You end up buying things you don't need and I feel like you end up buying the less healthy items as well because your brain is in that mindset of, I just need some food right now, whatever looks delicious. So I used to do this one a lot and I actually still to this day have to remind myself to either eat before I go shopping or if that is not possible, then to stick to the list. Which brings me to my next tip, make a list, but even before 
before that, make a plan. Aside from shopping hungry, I noticed that I used to overspend all the time if I didn't have a plan. I would go into the store and just be like, this looks good, this looks good, oh, I could make something with that. And boom, suddenly I've got half the store in my cart. So ever since I got back into meal prep, I have gotten back into the routine of plan first, then make your shopping list, then hit the grocery store, and I have saved a lot of money this way. Now, if you do wanna learn more about meal prep and how it has saved us so much money on groceries, I've left that link in the pinned comment down below. When you do make your meal plan and shopping list, it is also important to take inventory of what you have before going to the store. How many times have you ended up with two or three of the exact same item because you thought you were out and it turns out you had some in your pantry already? For me, it's happened a lot. Not to mention just clearing out your pantry or keeping an inventory list can help you use up some of those items you already have. For example, if I have raspberries in my freezer already, do I actually need that second or third fruit just to add into my oatmeal? Or if we have pasta to use up and and I'm in the mood for a stir fried rice, even though I have none of those ingredients, it's probably better just to make the pasta instead. So I've found that putting priority on eating what we already have has helped me cut spending quite a bit. Now, if you wanna save some money this year, and of course, save time and eat a bit healthier, and you're ready to start meal prepping, let's start with some of the basics that will help you out. I've broken down the fundamentals into categories so that you know the key elements of setting up a good prep. For veggies, I will always wash and chop pretty much everything as soon as I get it home from the store. I've actually started using my Vitamix chopping blades. They are so helpful, especially for onions. I really dislike chopping onions, so having the Vitamix is helpful for that, but there are a lot of less expensive options if you don't have a Vitamix. But even if I'm just cutting by hand, I find it so much easier to have the veggies already chopped in the fridge. Now, if it's a more fragile veggie like cucumbers and bell peppers, I will only chop enough to last about three or four days, but the hardier things like onions can stay chopped for about a week or so. And now, if I have time, I'll also do a quick steam on some of the veggies, and that way they are 100% ready to use in different dishes. So this is for things like broccoli, squash, zucchini, bok choy, basically anything that we eat cooked. With lettuce and other leafy greens, it's best to store them wrapped in tea towels or paper towels, and then in a Ziploc bag or in a Tupperware. And herbs are the same. They should be stored in either tea towel or paper towels so that it is just slightly damp in there, and that will keep them perfectly fresh for a couple weeks. Most of my fruit I will just keep on the counter, and that is for two reasons. One is so that it is ready to grab and go, and the second reason, of course, is to help it ripen. Once something is fully ripe, like this pineapple, for example, we'll just chop the whole thing and then keep it in either the fridge, or if we're not gonna eat it all right away, I sometimes put half of it into the freezer. And the same would be like for these tomatoes, they aren't quite ripe yet, so just keeping them on the counter with the other fruit will help ripen them. And then once they're soft and fully ripe, if we haven't eaten them all by then, then they'll go into the fridge, and that will slow down the ripening process. For avocado, you know, I honestly don't buy avocado that often anymore because it is so expensive. But when I do, I like to make sure that I am not having them all ripen at once. So I like to cycle them in and out of the fridge. So I'll just take one or two out at a time and let it ripen with the rest of the fruit. Then a few days after I've taken out that first one, I'll take out a second one. And then that one will be ready to eat a few days after the first one. And that way you're not stuck with like six ripe avocados all at once. But if that does end up happening, Happening for some reason, you can actually freeze avocados. Just go ahead and peel them, slice them, of course, remove the pit, and then you can use them in things like smoothies or in ice cream. And then for things like berries and grapes, I do wash them as soon as I get them home from the store. In fact, if you wanna see my berry washing tips, I'll link that video down below. But especially with things like strawberries that we usually eat once they're cut up, what I like to do is to cut half and keep the other half whole. I find that the cut ones obviously don't stay fresh as long. They're only good for two or three days but whole will stay fresh for at least a week or longer. So rather than chopping them all at once and not being able to finish them in two or three days, I prefer to just keep half of them chopped and once we finish those, then I chop the other half. I usually like to cook either a bean or grain or both during a batch prep as well. Now, if you buy your beans canned, you obviously don't have to worry about this because your beans will be already cooked and ready to use. But if you wanna save a little bit of money, you might wanna try homemade. Buying in bulk can save you money, but also reduce on packaging. And it's really easy. You actually don't even need an instant pot. You can definitely cook them on the stovetop or in the oven. And beans actually store really well in the freezer. So you can make a very large batch all at once and then portion them out so that you have a few weeks worth and go ahead and put them in the freezer, take one out each week and they're ready to use. And then for your grain, you can cook something like rice or it can be something like millet or quinoa or even something like pasta. A lot of people are actually surprised when I tell them that I batch cook pasta, but honestly, it does make it so much easier. Storing your noodles separately from your sauce will make sure that your noodles stay fresh, they don't get soggy, and then you can easily just take both out, microwave them together, and your meal is ready to go. 
The next most important thing to make during a batch prep is some kind of sauces or dressing. So things like hummus or cheese sauce or salad dressing. So even if I don't cook any meals during a batch prep, I like to at least have some salad dressings ready to go. And that way I can throw together a salad in just a couple minutes. So if you haven't seen the video I did with oil-free dressings, those are some of my favorites. So I'll link that down below in case you wanna check it out. But it could even be as simple as something like making a big batch of hummus, which you can use for both a dip and a salad dressing. And hummus freezes really well too. So you could always make a big batch and freeze part of it for later. Lastly, if I have time, I will prepare some ready to go meals. And what I like to do is make enough to last around three days. I just find it so much easier to make a large quantity all at once. And then if there is something left over that I haven't eaten in a few days, you can just pop that into the freezer, pull it out whenever you need it, and you have a full meal ready to go in a pinch. Now for anyone that is just starting out, you'll probably find that there is a bit of a learning curve at the beginning, but there are some basic tips that even I wish I knew when I was first starting on my meal prep journey, because I think they would have helped me out a lot. So I wanna share them with you so that you don't make the same mistakes that I did. The most important place to start is somewhere simple. I think that a lot of people, when they start meal prepping, they tend to take on too much too quickly and they easily get overwhelmed. Maybe they'll try to plan out and prepare a whole week's worth of meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that is quite a lot for a beginner. I personally recommend starting really small, even just doing two meals for two days, for example, and fully plan that out with your recipes. And once it's completed, see how you feel before you move on to something more advanced. My next suggestion that goes right along with that is to start with recipes that you already know and love. So a good place to start is by writing down all the recipes that you or your family loves. And actually, if you have a place where you collect recipes, like in a recipe binder or a place on your computer or your phone, that is great as well because it's gonna be really helpful to have them all in one place. For me, I'm old school. I like to hand write them out. Even if it's a recipe that I find online, I just like to hand write it and that way I can make adjustments to the quantities. I like to make little notes in the margins of the recipes. So I personally like to use the notebook. I have all of my favorites in here, but of course there are a lot of digital options nowadays as well, if that's something you prefer. Now it's important to note here that I personally don't feel meal prep is a good time to start trying new recipes that you've never made before. I like to save those for a weekend when I'm just making a one-off meal, because if it turns out to be something your family doesn't like, you don't wanna end up with a huge quantity of it. So for something we've never tried before, I'll usually just make a smaller quantity, enough for one meal. And then if it is something we love, it gets added to the book and then we can make a larger quantity the next time. If it's not sustainable for your lifestyle, it's not going to last. As you start meal prepping, you'll start to get into a groove and really find out what works for you and your family. And not everyone's routine is gonna look the same. For example, what I actually teach in my meal prep course is that there are different styles of meal prep. For some people, they may only have time to do what I call a wash and chop, which is just washing and chopping all of your veggies to cook later on in the week. Whereas other people might want those ready to go meals that they can just grab from the fridge and reheat when needed. So you may even wanna try out a couple different styles and see what works best for you and your family. But the most important thing is to make sure that it is sustainable and that you can do it week after week. Do not feel like you need to prep for every single day of the week. If you're in a busy house that might have last minute schedule changes, or maybe your family likes to eat out every single Wednesday, make sure you write that into your meal plan so that you can give yourself the flexibility to change up your dinners. Sometimes there might even be days where you just don't feel like eating what you've already prepped. And that's what I like to use the freezer for. So if I end up going out to dinner unplanned, or like if I just come home and I don't feel like eating what I've already prepped, I can pop that meal into the freezer and eat it at a later time. And as a bonus, then I have another ready to go meal in a few weeks time. Freezer meals can come in really handy as well. So it's never a bad idea to have a couple extra in your freezer. Increasing the quantity of something you're already cooking is one of the easiest ways to start meal prepping. This is actually how I got started before I started really getting into planning. I would just double the quantity of whatever I was cooking for dinner. And that way we had leftovers that we could eat on the next night. We simply reheated them on the stove or in the microwave. And that meant two days worth of meals from only cooking one time. So if you have a recipe that you already know and love, you might wanna start by just doubling or tripling that recipe. You can eat the leftovers later in that week, or even like I said, pop them into the freezer and then defrost them later on in the month. This is a really good transitional tool for anyone who is thinking about meal prep, but aren't sure that they want to plan out a full week's worth of meals. You can start really simply by just doubling or tripling your favorite recipe next time you cook it. 
So when I'm ready to start planning, here's what I like to do. Step one, get my recipes, which for me are all in my notebook. Step two, check my pantry, fridge, and freezer and plan my meals based on what I already have first. If I have a lot of lentils or split peas to use up, I'll have a look through my recipes and see if I have any that use up those items. And that way, if it's one less thing to buy at the store, it can save me money too. Step three, plan the right quantity. Now this is something that's often overlooked. I think when people usually find a recipe, they just follow it exactly as it's written. But it's important to plan the correct quantity of how much of that recipe you want. That is actually what I teach in my meal prep course. I show you exactly how to calculate your recipe so that you don't have too much or too little food and that will also end up saving you money because you don't end up overbuying. And step four, lastly, of course I will go shopping. And just as another bonus tip here, when I'm making out my grocery list, I like to make it in order of the store. So for example, if at the top of the list is lettuce and then I have a couple pantry items and then I have apples at the bottom of the list, if I'm following this list in order as I'm walking through the store, I'm going to end up running back and forth from the produce to the pantry and then back to produce again, which is a waste of time. So I personally like to organize my list in order of my grocery store. I put all my produce items first and this ends up saving me so much time. I'm in and out of the grocery store a lot faster and it also saves me from a lot of the impulse buys because I'm not wandering up and down every single aisle. I know exactly where I'm going and I just follow my list. Now tips and tricks are great, but sometimes we need to learn by example. So I want to show you an example batch prep so you can see exactly how I do things on a prep day. Now you can prep as as much or as little as you like here. I personally always like to focus on the veggies because I've just noticed that vegetables are my area of most resistance. If I don't have veggies prepped, I won't eat them. So let's get into this batch prep and I'll show you exactly what I mean. First things first, let's get some beans cooking in the Instant Pot. I'm just starting with two cups of white kidney beans, giving those a quick rinse first and then cooking them with a tiny piece of kombu for 32 minutes. I'm also preheating the oven to 400 degrees for our sweet potatoes. Now just filling the sink for all of our produce. Make sure you pierce your sweet potatoes so that they don't explode in the oven. And then you can also wash smaller items like the bok choy or asparagus separately. Mushrooms can also be rinsed, but I always wash them separately because they wash so quickly. Just give them a very quick wash with your hands and then drain them. I'm also starting a pot of water with a steam basket for all the veggies we'll be steaming. Now just keep in mind, you do not need to cook all of your veggies. The beauty of doing a batch prep is so that you can keep some veggies raw and cook some of them. It is totally up to you. I actually recommend writing out a meal plan for the week and that way you'll know which of your veggies you need already cooked and which you'd rather keep raw for later use. But if you're still a little bit uncomfortable planning out a whole meal prep, then I recommend doing something like steaming because it's a very versatile way to cook your veggies. You can just steam them lightly so that they're ready to be eaten throughout the week. You can throw them into salads, into soups onto a power bowl, etc. And I just find personally that I eat more veggies that way because I can just take them out of the fridge and they are 100% ready to eat. I'm chopping these asparagus in two different ways so that I can cook them differently. The small ones will be used for soup and these longer ones I'm going to briefly steam for about two minutes. Now let's say you do end up with some produce that is a little bit less than fresh. Don't immediately throw it out. There might be some ways to salvage it. If it's something like this that's just limp, a lot of times you can revive it with an ice cold water bath. This also works for things like celery and fresh herbs. Just give it a quick chop and then let it soak in cold water. And my second tip would be to make soup. Soup and even things like curry are a great way to use up all of those leftover veggies, even if they aren't as fresh as when you first bought them. These celery and carrots are going to be used in soup, so they are being chopped into smaller pieces. And then I've also left some of them snack size along with these cucumbers so that they are ready to grab and eat. And then all of this celery is just going to be juiced later. And you can actually store the celery in water in the fridge. This will help keep it fresh and crisp. Just change or replenish the water every few days. 
Now for boxed lettuce or boxed spinach like this that have already been washed, they come ready to use. So if you're not gonna be using them right away, I highly recommend adding in a little paper towel or you can even use kitchen towel and that will help absorb some of the moisture that's going to naturally accumulate inside the box. So basically it will help keep your greens fresher a little bit longer and it's super easy to do. You can just put the towel right inside this box. We can also use this hack for our other lettuce, which has been fully rehydrated after soaking in cold water. And now that our beans have finished cooking, I'm just transferring them to a Tupperware, giving a quick rinse to the inner liner of the Instant Pot, and then adding the trivet in so we can steam our golden beets. Now I'm going to get started on a lemon orzo soup. As you guys probably know by now, even when I do a batch prep, I like to have at least one prepared meal by the time I finish. That way I have something to eat later in the evening. So this is a very simple soup. Basically all you need is carrot, celery, onion, and then whatever kind of pasta you're using, I'm using orzo, and then of course veggie broth, and I will be adding lemon zest and lemon juice at the end. Just adding some better than bouillon paste and our orzo a couple sprigs of thyme. Meanwhile, once the beets are finished, you can go ahead and take them out. Let them fully cool before you try and peel them, but the skin should come off very easily. And oh my gosh, they are so beautiful. I just love golden beets. After about eight to 10 minutes, the orzo should be fully cooked and I'm just adding in that chopped asparagus, plus adding the zest of two lemons, the juice of one lemon, and some of our cooked white beans. Now that these veggies are prepped and ready to eat, I am much more likely to eat healthy this week and of course, actually use up the produce that I've bought. Now we've covered a bit about the basics of meal prep, how it can help us eat healthy and save money, but let's not forget how much time it can save us as well. Spending a few hours to prep on one day will actually add up to a lot of hours saved throughout the week, especially if you have the right tools. So if you've been longing for a way to make your prep faster and easier, these tools are guaranteed to help and that all starts with upgrading your storage system. Tupperware is probably one of the most important tools of meal prep. I mean, it's pretty hard to prep without having containers to put everything in. And you may not be thinking of Tupperware as a time saver, but it definitely can be depending on the kind that you get. Speaking from personal experience, my husband and I used to use a lot of plastic Tupperware. It is very convenient because it is lightweight, it is fairly inexpensive, and to be honest, it's just what we had when we moved here. So that is what we were using most often in the beginning. Until we realized how many dishes plastic Tupperwares create. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't personally feel comfortable putting plastic in the microwave or in the dishwasher. So that meant every time I took out a meal from a plastic Tupperware, I had to add it into a bowl to heat it up in the microwave. And then I was washing those plastic Tupperwares by hand. And for me, dishes are probably my least favorite thing to do in the kitchen. So I try and create as few of them as possible if I can. So as we started taking meal prep more seriously again, we decided to invest a little bit in some glass Tupperware that are dishwasher safe, including the lids. That was very important to me. And I personally really like the ones from Ikea. That's where most of our glass Tupperwares are from. I will leave all the links in the description box down below in case you wanna check them out. But I'm also not a big fan of throwing out your entire Tupperware collection to buy everything brand new. So my suggestion, if you do use a lot of plastic Tupperware and you wanna start switching out for glass ones is to pay attention to what shapes and sizes you use most often. It can help to have different shapes and sizes, of course, but just start paying attention to the ones you use most often and keep that in mind for when you're ready to replace them. So as you'll see in my meal prep videos, I do still use plastic. There are some that we just didn't feel the need to replace because they were working perfectly well and I don't feel like throwing them out just to replace them with glass. And then some I just feel are such a good shape and size that I mean, I just love these. It's hard for me to replace these. I don't know if I'll ever find the glass equivalent of this one, but they are a pain to wash by hand. So we are slowly changing them out and I think eventually we will switch over to all glass. So of course a good knife and cutting board are essential. I think most people already have those in their kitchen, but there are a couple other tools that will save you time when cutting. Spiralizers, I love spiralizers. 
I don't love this one for other reasons, which I will get into in another video, but they are generally a helpful tool, especially if you do a lot of zucchini noodles, AKA zoodles, and they work really well for carrots as well. So if you're a person who does a lot of veggie noodles, then I do recommend having a spiralizer in your kitchen. Julianers, well, that's what I call them. I don't know what's the official name for these tools. I call them Julianers because they essentially help you cut into a julienne style cutting shape. Some of these are actually my mother-in-law's. She is the one who introduced me to this tool. And ever since then, I've been obsessed with it. It is so, so handy, especially for cutting vegetables very thinly, like for spring rolls, for sushi, for veggie noodle bowls, etc. So these are obviously much easier to use than chopping very finely with a knife. And they do save so much time. Now, if you don't have a tool like this and you don't want to add another tool to your kitchen, I have found the vegetable peeler to be a really good workaround. It does, of course, make much thicker strips, but it is a multifunctional tool because it also works as a peeler. So if you're trying to keep your kitchen tools to a minimum, then this is a good option because it serves both functions. I never used to understand the benefits of owning a kitchen scale until I owned one. I actually purchased one a couple years ago when I first started making bread. I feel it is very essential if you wanna make bread, but then I started using it for like everything. It really does make everything so much easier. It saves you time with measuring out quantities. And of course, using less measuring cups also means less dishes. They're pretty inexpensive on Amazon. I'll link this one down below. A very underrated tool in my opinion. As someone who has owned a lot of blenders, I can definitely say that as soon as I got a Vitamix, I noticed how much time it saved. Personally, I blend a lot of nuts, especially things like cashews, and I make a lot of hummus. And those things used to take a very long time in the blender. They didn't always come out smooth. And so switching to the Vitamix, I have noticed it just is a lot faster and a lot more efficient. Now it doesn't need to be a Vitamix. I think there are a lot of other really good high-speed blender brands. In fact, if anybody has one to recommend, let us know in the comments down below. But if you are in the market for a new blender and you are interested in the Vitamix, I would highly recommend the model that I purchased, if not for any other reason than the fact that it comes with these smoothie cups. I use these maybe even more often than the big jug. And for the model I have, you can also add the food processor attachment, which I will talk about later. And one way that I saved a little bit of money with my Vitamix is to buy a refurbished one. Now refurbished basically just means used, but Vitamix goes through and services everything on the blender before putting it up for sale again and they actually give you a new pitcher so this part is not used but it is less expensive than buying a brand new one and honestly it works perfectly well no one would even know that it is a refurbished one so that is my recommendation if you are in the market for a Vitamix but like I said there are plenty of other brands and if anybody has one to recommend let us know in the comments below Unfortunately, the blender and the food processor are not the same. They do have pretty different functions. So I personally feel that both tools are necessary, especially if you're trying to save time. I just feel that a food processor is really handy. Now, this is the one that goes on top of my Vitamix base. So I do feel like it was a good investment to get that model because it allowed me to get this food processor attachment, which also has chopping blades. I have to say one of the best features of this food processor is the chopping blades. The downsides of this food processor is that it is really big and bulky and clunky and I don't always feel like taking it out and it's really loud like louder than the blender. That is my only gripe with Vitamix and their food processor but the speed and efficiency at which it chops makes it worth it. Like I hate chopping onions. So on a meal prep day, I will just chop five or six at once. Most of them will go into the freezer for later use. And obviously that saves me so much time. In addition, I also use the food processor to save time on things that I would otherwise have to do by hand, like kneading seitan dough or chopping nuts and dates for energy balls or making big batches of no tuna chickpea salad. So yes, not only does it save time, but it also saves me energy and effort. Now, if a Vitamix is too much of an investment at this time. This is my budget friendly option that I used to use all the time and I still do use for smaller batches. This little tool, it's actually an immersion blender slash mini chopper. This is so inexpensive and so, so handy. Before I had the Vitamix food processor, I would always use this. It's just inconvenient because it's small batches, but if you are only making food for one or two people, this can actually work quite well for that. It is a very powerful chopper. I used to make a lot of things you can probably see in my other meal prep videos. I've used this many, many times before. And 
And like I said, it comes also with this immersion blender. I don't use the immersion blender as often as a regular blender, but it is nice in winter when I'm making a lot of soups and stews. If you have something on the stove top, it's much easier to immersion blend a big pot than it is to pour everything into a blender jug. So I do use this on occasion for things like that. And of course, saving the best for last, I could write an essay on how much I love this machine. The Instant Pot was actually the first tool I bought when I moved to Canada. And I think at that time it was like all the rage, everybody was buying one. I didn't even really know what I was going to be cooking in it, but I was like, okay, it looks like a pretty helpful tool. You can cook a lot of different kinds of things in there. Let me get one. I had no idea how amazing this tool could be. When I first got the Instant Pot, I thought that the word instant meant that it cooks everything really fast, but that is actually not what is so great about this machine and actually not what really saves you time. 100% the best feature of this machine is the hands-off cooking abilities. To set it and forget it is the absolute best. So when I'm doing a meal prep, I can just cycle things in and out of here and I don't have to worry about boiling water, having things spill over, having to check for dense it is really just a hands-off tool. You can put everything inside, press whichever button you need, and you're ready to go. Plus, I can cook large quantities in here and then freeze them for later use. So usually I'll just make a big pot of beans or stew or whatever I'm cooking and then portion them out individually, put them in the freezer, and then we have meals ready to go later on, which also saves time. Having these tools has definitely made the meal prep process faster and overall has just made my time in the kitchen much more enjoyable. As someone who used to cook a lot, well, at least every single day for dinner, I noticed I was starting to get burned out on cooking every single day. Since starting to meal prep, I actually took a step back and examined how I used to cook before we started meal prepping. And I was like, wow, I do not miss any of those things. So in no particular order, here is what I do not miss about cooking every day. Number one, I do not miss having to think about what to make for dinner every single day. Let me know if this is a familiar scene in your house. Around four or 5 p.m. every single day, someone is coming up to you, asking you that famous question, what's for dinner? I don't even have kids and I still used to get tired of having to think about what to cook for us every single day. Versus when you have your fridge and freezer prepped with ready to go meals, you don't have to think or plan or decide. You can just take something out and heat it up. You do still of course have to plan and prep like maybe one day per week. Usually I like to sit down on a Friday and think about what we're going to be eating for the next week. And at that time I also do my shopping list, but only one time a week versus every day let me know which one you would prefer. If this is a familiar problem for you, leave a tired face emoji in the comments to let me know you are tired of thinking about what to cook. Which brings me to my next point. I do not miss cooking every day. And this is coming from someone who really loves to cook. I really enjoy cooking, but do you ever have one of those days when you feel like literally the last thing you wanna do is cook something? Recently, I actually took maybe two weeks off from cooking and I distinctly remember apologizing to my husband and was like, I just do not feel like cooking. But it actually worked out fine because we were eating leftovers. I had some things that I had already prepped in the freezer. And then my husband stepped up and he cooked some big batches of pasta and soup. So we would eat those for a few days in a row. And I just relished in that time off. Again, I really enjoy cooking, but after cooking basically every day for nearly 20 years, sometimes I need a break. Not to mention my husband and I have pretty different work schedules. Sometimes he gets home quite late after I've already eaten dinner. And let me tell you, having him be able to whip up his own dinner in like five minutes or less is a game changer. Now, I do not feel obligated to cook for him. He can make dinner for himself, but I also know that if there's nothing prepped, he's likely going to make an instant noodle. So it is nice not to have to worry about cooking a separate meal for him or making sure he has something healthy to eat. Something else I do not miss, doing the dishes all the time. Now, of course, I still do dishes. I literally have dishes in my sink right now waiting for me to do them. Even with meal prep, we use dishes. We use plates, Tupperware, silverware, all of those things we still use on a daily basis. But let me tell you, the amount of dishes has reduced drastically. Think about what you typically need to cook a meal. Maybe you'll need a cutting board, a knife, a large pot, a pan, a colander, a strainer, a stir spoon, a spatula, maybe a baking sheet or the Instant Pot or a steam rack or even like a grater or can opener. Now I'm not saying you're gonna be using those items every single time you cook, but you will need at least a few. So think about washing those few items every 
single day versus with meal prep, you're just gonna use them one time per week and when you're done with them, you put them away. You don't even have to think about them for another week. Number four, I do not miss spending too much money on takeout. True story, I grew up in a pretty small town in California and when I moved to Hong Kong, I was like dazzled by the big city life. People were eating out all the time. The restaurants are really, really good there. And one of the first places that I lived was actually at the top of a very steep hill and there is a big escalator, like travelator to get up there. I think it's actually one of the longest outdoor travelators in the world. It's really cool. But every day on my way home, I would pass by this restaurant called Life Cafe and they had the best salads and the best tofu chocolate cake. Oh my gosh, it was so good. So I started eating out there or other places, maybe like three or four times a week because it was convenient. It was on my way home. And I also knew that if I got home, I would have to cook something and I just didn't want to do that. But I also quickly realized that I was spending way too much on takeout. It was not financially sustainable to keep doing that. So if you yourself are thinking you're spending way too much money on takeout, especially in the current economic climate, it might be time to make a change. If that sounds like you, leave a money emoji in the comments and let me know you are one of those people who spends way too much money on takeout. It's okay, I've been there. Now, if you're thinking, hey, I wanna cook less, I want to do less dishes, I wanna save money each month, then you might be ready to start meal prepping. And if you are and you want some more guidance, I actually have a step-by-step -step course that teaches you how to meal prep. It's called the Let's Eat Plants Meal Prep Course, and I'm gonna leave the sign up for it in the description box down below so that you can get on the wait list for the next round that's gonna be opening very soon. But in the meantime, if you're ready to give it a go on your own and you want just like a super basic pared down prep, check out this one here. This is a simple 20 minute prep that anyone can do to set themselves up with healthy options for the week.